is alive. And I'm not speaking metaphorically. Literally, there's life in there. You might notice the toy poodle in the corner, but that's not what I'm talking about. There's physically a woman underneath a painting of the woman. I don't make my paintings on canvas. I paint on top of whatever it is I want to paint a picture of, directly in three-dimensional space. And in this way, I'm able to transform the space into a seemingly two-dimensional painting, all without Photoshop. So if I'm going to be painting your portrait, I'm physically painting on you, literally from head to toe. Everything gets covered in a mask of paint. In addition to painting people, I'll also paint the backgrounds. And you might notice that in the background of this painting, it looks like there's a car. And that's because there actually is a car. It doesn't matter how big the object is, how much depth it has, I'm still able to make it look like a flat painting, and not from just one fixed vantage point, but from every angle that you want to look at it. Like a lot of kids, I had big dreams, and my big dream was to grow up to be an artist someday. However, I thought that to be an artist, it meant that you were a painter, and that you were so good at painting that you can make something like feel real enough that it would come to life. The problem was, I wasn't that good of a painter. And I tried my hardest. I would make a painting, and I would see just like one spot that looked a little bit off to me. And then I'd go back in, fix it, and inevitably, the fix would make it worse. And then I would just keep on working on it until that section was just right. And then I realized it no longer matched the rest of the painting. And I'd have to go back and rework all of that. And I could never finish anything because I could always find an imperfection, and I felt like I could do better than that, and I was constantly disappointing myself. I don't even really have any of my old paintings from canvas from when I was a kid, because I didn't think they were worth keeping, and I threw them away. It was a really hard realization for me that maybe I didn't have what it took to be an artist, and that this dream I'd had was utterly ridiculous, and it was better to just give up and find a new dream. Growing up in Washington, D.C., it was pretty easy to uh, look outside my door and find another idea for what I wanted to do with my life. And I thought that my next step would be to have a career in politics. And I did anything I could to make this dream come true, because this felt like something that was quite reasonable. There were a certain sequence of steps you would take to get a job behind a desk. And so, during my high school years, I started working on Capitol Hill, and whenever the congressman would be out to lunch, I would sit down at his desk and play congresswoman, and I worked on political campaigns, and in college, I studied political science, and I had everything lined up just perfectly. However, I was about to graduate from college, and I had this idea. I thought that it would be really cool to see what happened if I put black paint in shadows. I just wanted to see, like, what it would be like, you know, to paint on the grass and to take something intangible, the absence of light, and give it materiality and presence. And then I thought, what if in addition to painting the absence of light, I put paint on light itself, and I could create a gradient of the light, how it fell in a space. And so I took my friend Bernie, and he had no idea what he was getting himself into when I told him that I wanted to paint light on him. And I also had no idea what I was getting myself into either. I quickly slapped on the paint, and I took a step back, and all of a sudden, I realized I turned my friend into a painting. And even more shockingly to me, I realized I had finished a painting. It hadn't even occurred to me through this process of putting paint on him that I was painting again. It had been like six years since I had touched paint, and I suppose because I hadn't thought of it in this project as like, creating something perfect, a masterpiece on canvas, I was able to approach it as just like an experiment with light and shadow. I was really excited. I hadn't felt this alive with my art in years, but I was just about to start the first step of my big dream of going into a world of politics. I decided instead of taking that step forward, going up to Capitol Hill, then instead I would take a step back and look towards my childhood dream and go down to my parents' basement and make it my job to teach myself how to paint in this style. However, I was really scared because the last time I had tried painting, I'd gotten all caught up in all of these things about making it perfect. 
And I decided that to avoid that trap, I would set up rules for myself. If I sat down to paint something, I had to finish it. And I had to finish it in that sitting. So I wouldn't have time to come back in later with fresh eyes and think that I was making it better when, in fact, I'd be making it worse. So in order to enforce this, I chose subjects that had to be painted so fast, otherwise they would disappear. Um, for example, when I wanted to paint a grapefruit, I would put down a brush stroke, and the acid and the citrus would eat through the paints from the underside. And it would be like creating something with invisible ink, because in moments, my painting would be gone. And then if I wanted to paint on something like my breakfast, by lunchtime, <laughs> it would be really disgusting. The oil from like, the eggs and sausage would rise to the surface, and it was not pretty. But it did ensure that I got it done. I was really nervous about bringing people down to my studio because all my other friends had real jobs and they weren't hanging out putting like hairspray on grapefruits like I was with my time. And I was also nervous too because I wasn't sure if this whole thing was a waste of my time. And I didn't want to bring somebody in and have them sit and paint them and have it be a disaster. So I did a lot of my early experience of painting on people on myself. And then finally, once I started building enough confidence in my ability to paint again, I decided I wanted to start painting on other models. But a frustration was that I had nothing I could do with them. I wasn't getting any art shows. I had nowhere to put them on exhibit. And so I decided to take matters into my own hands and bring my art to the public in a very um, confrontational way, taking models on the subway. And Everyone in that train, I guess, was in an art show opening, just they didn't know it at the time. When it started, I was worried that it would be a waste of time, but I was proving to myself that I was onto something worthwhile. But I still couldn't bring it to myself to spend money on this, because I didn't have a job, and I didn't really know where it was going. But then I started getting really frustrated because I'd been using like, the cheapest paintbrushes I could find and the cheapest like, big vats of paint. It was essentially like kindergarten finger paint. It was non-toxic, which was great, but it went on so roughly, and I felt like I was really inhibited by this. In a lot of my early works, you can see it. You can see the thick brush strokes, the big globs of paint, and that wasn't so much at the time because I was trying to express that, as I had no other choice. I decided that you know, it was time, since I was taking myself more seriously as an artist, to get the serious tools of an artist. I went out and I bought the fanciest paintbrushes and these little tubes of paint. They're still non-toxic, don't worry. And I wanted to set out to create my masterpiece. Rather than painting on another model who you know, might be complaining that they need to go to the bathroom or their foot's falling asleep, I would paint on myself, and I would paint all night if I had to, to get it just right. As I was painting myself, I was feeling like I was finally making it happen. I was creating this work that expressed my true talents, that I was showing the world what I could do. But then when I took a look at what I'd created, it was just creepy. <laughs> It had lacked all of the magic of my previous paintings. In erasing all of the perfections, I had made something that didn't feel alive, but instead felt like... <laughs> I, I don't even know what to say. It, it just didn't speak to me, and yet it was me, and that was a difficult thing to confront. It was like I had reached this uncanny valley problem, in which the closer I got to trying to mimic reality, the farther away it got from actually capturing it. And when I look back to one of the first times I'd painted myself, I had captured so much more life in it. There was something more compelling in it. You could see the stray brush strokes, and it gave it this absolutely human touch. I realized that the less I tried to rigidly enforce this perfect replication of reality, the more real it would almost feel. It would feel vibrant. It would come to life. And most importantly for me, while I was creating it, it would actually make me feel alive. I was connecting with my art. When I was in high school, I wasn't connecting at all because I was in search of perfection. I was trying to make a masterpiece. I wanted to be a great artist. And for me, that had meant trying to paint something to make it look real. And yet I found, for me now, the opposite has held true. I'd flipped my perspective around. And instead of trying to paint something to look real, I'm taking something real and turning it into a painting. 
and have finally been able to find my voice as an artist and make my art come to life. Thank you.